Okay, Todd, we appear to be uh, live here on Facebook, um, so I'll just uh, quick introduce you. So good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Tri-State Railway Historical Society's second meeting on the Northeast Corridor this month uh, with author Todd DeFeo. Uh, Todd just published a book. Todd, are you there? Oh, were you there? There we go. It froze here for a second, so I guess we're, we're back on. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So uh, <laughs> I just introduced you to the crowd, and uh, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Well, I am very excited to be here, everybody. If I can do this correctly, I am going to try to share this presentation I've put together. And if somebody can just let me know if this uh, looks correct or if I have it backwards. While I uh, wait for it to uh, pull up, I will just say I'm very excited to be here. I think any opportunity that I have to talk about the Northeast Corridor makes any day a great day. So uh, Northeast Corridor is, of course, one of my favorite rail lines. Uh, that's why I wrote a book about it. Why else would you write a book about it, right? I just have a brief presentation here today. Um, and I'm happy to take certainly any questions that uh, you may have about the Northeast Corridor. I'd love to go on and on and on about the Northeast Corridor. Uh, but I do want to make these presentations fun because after all, I think it's important to remember that we are talking about trains, right? So we can't be too serious. We got to have a little bit of fun because again, railroads. Does this presentation look right, uh, Richie? Is that is it lining up or driving backwards? Yeah, you're all good. It's uh, it's full screen. Perfect. Fantastic. I just like to make sure before I go too deep, I don't want to go all the way through this and realize I have my slides backwards. Um, so as I pulled the presentation together, um, I started thinking about what is the right picture that I should start with? What is the single picture that best defines the Northeast Corridor? I spent a lot of time, more time than I should admit that I spent on that question, looking through a bunch of, of pictures. As I put together my, my book on the Northeast Corridor, I pulled together, I think, 180, 184 pictures total. And how do you find one that best defines for a cover slide? And I opted for this picture right here. This is a picture of the uh, uh, steam train going across the Delaware River. I thought it was a, a perfect symbol of the Northeast Corridor. And what I found so interesting about it is if you asked a dozen people, what picture would they go with? You'd probably get a dozen different answers. If you're the commuter who maybe is stuck on the evening train, either heading uh, out of uh, the city, you probably pick a, a stop train for a power outage. If you were uh, somebody like me who maybe grew up along the Northeast Corridor in Matuch, you might pick the train station as a, an example of the, the, the corridor. But I went with this picture because the bridge, the stone bridge spanning the Delaware River, aside from it being a great postcard, I think it's really a symbol of the infrastructure of the Northeast Corridor. And the infrastructure up and down this line is just remarkable. We're going to touch briefly on the current state of the Northeast Corridor and the current infrastructure state. But if we stop and think about it for a moment, this line was an engineering marvel from the day that it was built. The railroads that built this line that we today know as the Northeast Corridor, they crossed rivers. They tunneled beneath rivers. They built incredible bridges. They built magnificent stations up and down the line. And we might not think about that today when we're taking the Acela, perhaps between Washington and Boston or, or points in between. But the Northeast Corridor really is an engineering marvel. Portions of the railroad are upwards of 190 years old, and it is still an integral part of our daily lives. I stopped when I was putting this together and started to think about what were the original engineers who built this line and the workers who built this line, what would they think about that if they knew that? Did they think that the work they were doing would be such a vital part of our infrastructure today and how we move from point A to point B? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I ponder that every time I put together one of these presentations. And the other thing I'll say, the hardest part about giving a presentation on the Northeast border is really the amount of time it would take to tell the entire history of the line. It could take days, months maybe even, to go all the different towns along the line, how the railroad impacted them and their relationship with the railroad. So what I try to do for this presentation today is focus on some of the highlights of the Northeast Corridor, moments in time that make this line the one that we know and love today. 
So as I sought to pull together some information and talk about the Northeast Corridor, I started with one very simple question. What is the Northeast Corridor? Not from a literal standpoint, but more figuratively, more philosophically perhaps. And I think there's a few ways you could look at the Northeast Corridor. You could certainly look at it at the trains themselves. And I put a picture on here, a postcard of the Pennsylvania Railroad's Pennsylvania Special Train that ran from Jersey City to Chicago. Train operated uh, from 1905 until 1912, was replaced by another train. You've got the infrastructure. I talked a little bit about the infrastructure a moment ago. So I put another picture here of the bridge over the Delaware River. But perhaps most importantly, there's the communities themselves, the commerce, the movement of people that the Northeast Corridor facilitated. So I found this great picture just outside of Newark Penn Station, circa 1911 along Market Street. So before I jump in too deep and go a little bit deeper into some of these thoughts that I had, I wanted to just make sure everybody was aware of what the Northeast Corridor, where it runs from a, just a, a line standpoint. I presume everybody on this call is, but I thought I'd just give a quick overview. It uh, of course runs from uh, Washington DC, which is the blue dot on the bottom here, all the way up to Boston, which is the white dot on the top. I, a couple of the, the key cities, there's a lot of cities that it runs through, but uh, Philadelphia is the red uh, pin, I guess I should say, not really dot. And then uh, New York City is the uh, black dot on here. And to me, what I think is so interesting about the Northeast Corridor, when we look at it, is we think about it today perhaps as a single line, right? If you're in Boston and you're going to DC or you're in New York and you're going to Philadelphia, it's just one line. We don't really think about it as multiple segments of a line. But the Northeast Corridor of today was not built as a single rail line. It was a disparate group of smaller railroads that really came together to make a single line that ultimately ran between Boston and Washington, D.C. It really wasn't until the 1960s that the Northeast Corridor actually got the name of the Northeast Corridor. And when we look back on this, and we're going to get a little bit deeper into this, there's some incredible visionaries from more than a century ago that had some just an incredible foresight to build this line and make it this important economic engine that it is today. And the legacy of the railroads that built this stretch of track really is visible if you're taking any portion of the Northeast Corridor. We're going to talk about Penn Station in New York City, the original Penn Station, and a little bit about the modern Penn Station. We're going to talk about the tunnels between New Jersey and, and New York City. Those are really an important part of the discussion when you're talking about the modern incarnation of the Northeast Corridor. It's a discussion point we're having today. And we're going to talk a lot about the electrification of the line, which really brought it into the modern railroad that we know is that it is today. And the single point that I would say when we get to the Northeast Corridor and try to define it, I'd like to look back at ancient Rome for some inspiration here and say, Rome wasn't built in a day and neither was the Northeast Corridor. And I say that only because the Northeast Corridor has evolved from its earliest days and it continues to evolve even today. So we're gonna take a step back in time for a moment and look at some of these smaller, lesser known railroads that perhaps Maybe we don't necessarily know as much about them today, but these are the railroads that really built the Northeast Corridor. This is just a couple, this isn't even all of them. And I think this is an incredible list when you stop to think about all these different railroads that built small portions of the entire Boston to DC line. In New Jersey, you've got great railroads like the Camden and Amboy, the New Jersey Transportation Company, Railroad and Transportation Company, which joined together to become the United New Jersey Railroad and Canal Company. Of course, the Pennsylvania Railroad, which we're gonna talk a lot about today. But you've got railroads that built smaller portions of it that are just as vital. The Philadelphia and Trenton Railroad, the Connecting Railway, which built a section through Philadelphia. They built these small little portions of track. Maybe didn't necessarily realize just how important the work that they were doing that would ultimately fold up into something like the Northeast Corridor. Very quickly, I, I started to put every single date that was important to the line on this one slide, and I realized you couldn't read it. It was a totally pointless slide. So I just pulled together about five of the key moments in some of the earliest years that were, were really important. And, and you could go back and you could look at the Camden and Amboy Railroad, which ultimately built the section of track between Trenton and New Brunswick. You've got the New Jersey Railroad and Transportation, which more or less built the section between New York, Jersey City, really, and New Brunswick. You've got some incredible engineering marvels that they completed as well. Cuts like the Bergen Cut, 
But what I found so interesting about it, we think it's just how indispensable of a line it is today. And we think people from day one must have been taking it to get you know, all the way down to Washington, D.C. And that wasn't the case. It took 30 years after the start of the Northeast Corridor, if you put the starting point at about 1830, it took about 30 years to really get through trains running all the way from New York to Washington. And of course, the line really catapulted forward in 1871 when the Pennsylvania Railroad came in and took over the companies that were operating the Northeast Corridor. And I think when you look about efficiencies and, and sort of maybe the modern you know, flexibility that a, a corridor like this provides us, we think this is incredible, right? You can be in New York City, you can be in the heart of New York City, and you can jump on a train and a few hours later, you can be in the nation's capital. Or if you want to go north, you can go to Boston. But we think about these earliest trains. The idea of going from New York to Washington, D.C. was incredible. But it took an, a long time. I mean, it took about eight hours for trains to operate between those two those two points. And it's just, it was not an efficient line. We think about, maybe we complain about it today when our commuter train on the Northeast Corridor gets, gets stuck, if the power goes out or for whatever reason it's stopped. And that's a minor, a minor disturbance that we might be encountering, but it is still a very reliable corridor along the lines. And I mentioned the Pennsylvania Railroad. We're gonna go a lot deeper on the Pennsylvania Railroad, but they really, modernize the line and help build it into what we know of today. This is, this is, after all, the standard railroad of the world. So hang on to that thought as we go through this presentation. But just quickly, I'll talk a little bit about the infrastructure projects that, and mention some of the infrastructure projects that they did. They, they really helped modernize the road. And they operated this line for about a century until 1968, ushering a little bit more of the modern era. Very quickly, I want to just touch on one of the incredible locomotives, the early locomotives that operated over the line, the John Bull locomotive, which was built in England in the 1830s, and it operated on the Camden and Amboy Railroad, and it continued to operate for until the 1890s, when it traveled actually, if you can believe this, as a 63, four, five-year-old locomotive, it traveled from Jersey City to Chicago for the World's Exposition there in Chicago. And behind this, uh, the words on this page is our, our postcard of that locomotive when it stopped in Rawway, New Jersey, traveling from Jersey City to Chicago. And it stopped all up and down the line. People came out to greet it. Um, the, the town of Metuchen, the ladies of Metuchen presented the crew with a box of beautiful buttonhole bouquets to guests and the train crew. And I think it's really important because it really illustrates the importance that the Northeast Corridor had on many different communities. We think about it today, perhaps in the context of a commuter railroad, but if you lived in any one of these communities up and down the line, it was your link to the outside world in many ways. It was the ability, it gave you the ability to travel elsewhere. It gave you the ability to get goods and commerce, bring in goods to your town, send your goods out of town. And it really gave you the opportunity to stay connected to the outside world. But the biggest moment in time, the biggest, perhaps the, the organization that left their, the biggest fingerprints on the Northeast Corridor was the Pennsylvania Railroad when they took over the line starting in 1871. The Pennsylvania Railroad was chartered in, in as its name might suggest, Pennsylvania in 1846. Now, we could really do an entire presentation on the Pennsylvania Railroad, so it's going to be hard to uh, stuff the history of this incredible railroad into one slide, but I'm going to give it a, a good attempt to do so. And really what I wanted to focus more on when it comes to the Pennsylvania Railroad is its role and its impact in shaping the Northeast Corridor into the line that we know of today. And I thought the best way to do that was actually to start with a few of the folks who were behind the changing of this line, the transformation of this line. And I wanted to start with J. Edgar Thompson, John Edgar Thompson, the gentleman on the left, who led the Pennsylvania Railroad from 1852 until 1847. And it was under his leadership that this railroad grew exponentially. And that included the acquisition of the United New Jersey Railroad and Canal Company, which effectively ran the line through New Jersey. 
When he had passed away in 1874, the New York Herald newspaper wrote, in all the movements which have resulted in the present enormous extension of the business of the Pennsylvania Railroad, Mr. Thompson, as its president, took an active and leading part and is deserving of credit. The second person I wanted to highlight was the man to his right, Samuel Ray, who joined the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1871, the same year that the company took over the United Companies in New Jersey. And one of his most significant accomplishments is perhaps helping to run the railroad into New York City, helping it cross the river. On January 1st of 1907, he laid the cornerstone of the new structure at the corner of 7th Avenue and 33rd Street in Manhattan. No, this wasn't Madison Square Garden, which stands there today. It was the original incarnation of Pennsylvania Station, which opened in 1910, serving the Long Island Railroad and the Pennsylvania Railroad. He went on to serve as the president of the railroad, as a fact, their ninth president from 1913 to 1925. To his right, or actually to his left, to our, on the right, second from the left, we've got Alexander J. Cassatt. He was the seventh president of the railroad, serving from 1899 to 1906, and joining the railroad in 1861. He began as an engineer, rose, his, rose through the company's ranks. And he was really only president for just a few short years, but his few short years that he was president, his impact was tremendous. In fact, it was him, in the summer of, eight, of summer of 1901, who traveled to Europe for vacation. And while he was in Paris, he was the vice president of the railroad at this point in time, Samuel Ray, I'm sorry, Samuel Ray, who was the vice president of the railroad at this time, urged Cassatt to explore the new Garde d'Orsay railroad station. If anybody's been to Paris, this is, of course, a famous art museum today. While at the Garde d'Orsay, Cassatt spent a significant amount of time studying how the railroad used electric trains to maneuver people in and out of the station. And it was watching this and observing this that Cassatt had a bold new plan that the Pennsylvania Railroad would actually build a tunnel beneath the Hudson River and bring its trains from New Jersey into the heart of New York City. And he actually announced this plan in December of 1901. The railroad for many years had wanted to build into New York City and it was unable to do so. It had looked at doing bridges. Other people had unsuccessfully tried to tunnel underneath the Hudson River. But in December of 1901, Cassatt announced the plan to do so. And ultimately the railroad was successful in doing so, which we'll get to in a moment. And last but not least, the gentleman on the far right of the slide is Ivy Lee. As the Pennsylvania Railroad was building its tunnels in Penn Station, Lee, along with his business partner, George F. Parker, actually spawned a new industry, if you can believe it, the industry of public relations. You see, the Pennsylvania Railroad hired Lee to help change its perception among the public. This was such a novel concept that the Wall Street Journal in 1906 remarked that Pennsylvania Railroad recognizes the value of having the news of this great enterprise put accurately before the public. So if you're a fan of public relations or you don't like public relations, you can blame the Pennsylvania Railroad for their role in helping create the industry. I say that as somebody in the public relations industry that uh, I, I like to look back on that. So we're gonna take a, a step back slightly as we build up to marching into New York City and building into New York City and focus on a moment on this incredible project that the Pennsylvania Railroad undertook starting in the 1890s and continuing to the early part of the 19th centuries to really modernize their line and to elevate their line. If you could imagine in the 1890s and early 1900s, the Northeast Corridor or the railroads that ultimately became the Northeast Corridor operated at grade. That means they were grade crossings up and down the line. And if you could imagine today, that would be incredibly dangerous. And it was very dangerous at that, that point in time as well. And the Pennsylvania Railroad recognized this. And they undertook a program to elevate their tracks up and down the line. In 1893, for example, the first train passed over an elevated trussle in Elizabeth, New Jersey. 
Around this time, the railroad also, op also elevated its tracks in Newark, New Jersey, opening a new station there. Not the current Penn Station that we know of today, but a predecessor station. And up and down the line, the railroad undertook this inc these incredible projects to elevate the line. In 1901, they announced a huge plan. This is the same time that they're getting ready to announce building a tunnel in New York City. They announced plans to elevate tracks through Wilmington, Delaware. As part of this, the railroad needed to build a new station, the station which still stands today. A few years later, in 1913, the new Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Railroad opened a new $60,000 station in Rawway. And up and down the line, there were new stations. So the, the pictures that you see here, the top picture is a picture of the work in Wilmington, Delaware. And below is a picture of the new railroad station in Rawway, New Jersey which is not the station in Rawway, New Jersey today. That opened in the 1970s under Penn Central, I believe, and was uh, later redone in about 1999, I want to say. But aside, the, the, the elevation of the line really had two benefits for the railroad. Of course, getting rid of grade crossings helped, I guess, really with both of them. It helped from a safety standpoint, but it also helped run trains more rapidly up and down the line. And the Railway Age, a publication that is still around today, in 1907 took note of this and noted that the improvements are gonna save several minutes in the running time between Philadelphia and Baltimore, marking another step in the accomplishment of the purpose of the Pennsylvania Rail to eventually reduce its running time between New York and Washington to four hours. Four hours, incredible. You think about this, decades earlier, it was, it was taking a lot longer than that to travel further between New York and Washington, D.C., and we're down to four hours. It's a little quicker today, but four hours in, in the early, the first decade of the 1900s, remarkable. If you think about it, actually 70 years earlier, it took five or six hours to travel just between New York City and Philadelphia, and here we are going four hours, a much longer way. It's just, it's just remarkable. And these improvements ultimately played into the improvement we talked about a moment ago, tunneling beneath the Hudson River. It, it would be hard to sit and say if there was one single project that had the biggest impact on the Northeast Quarter. I, I don't know, they, you, you, we could have a great debate of what was the single project that was the, the biggest impact on the corridor. This would certainly be in the running. And it wasn't just tunneling beneath the river, as if that wasn't impressive enough. The railroad also decided it was gonna build this massive structure in the heart of Manhattan, Penn Station, which if you can believe it, before the Penn Station of today, today it's in the basement of uh, Madison Square Garden, although they're, they're working to change that. This was a massive, massive structure that led in incredible amounts of light. And it was simply named Pennsylvania Station. What else was you named it, of course? Now, I mentioned a moment ago, the Pennsylvania Railroad having long sought to bring its trains into the city. And it wasn't just as easy as building a tunnel. It sounds, I maybe mean, it's not easy, but you say, hey, I'm just gonna build a tunnel, right? Well, it took a lot. This is the culmination of really 20 years of work, of serious work. I mean, they hired an engineer in the 1890s to build a bridge even before the Pennsylvania Railroad got involved, there was an industrialist named DeWitt Clinton Haskins who tried to tunnel underneath the river. I alluded to this a moment ago, starting in 1879. He spent a decade trying to tunnel under the river, a decade. And he ultimately, after several blowouts, gave up on his project, which of course led the Pennsylvania Railroad to hire an engineer to build a bridge. Other railroads thought that was too expensive, so they abandoned it. And ultimately what happened is the Pennsylvania Railroad never really gave up on the idea, but they, they were they perhaps weren't as active. And it took another 10 years until Cassatt, as I mentioned a moment ago, announced his plan to tunnel beneath the Hudson River. The tunnel though, it posed a lot of problems. Again, as if building a tunnel wasn't enough, but one of the biggest problems was you couldn't run steam trains through it. A couple reasons, uh, exhaust in the tunnel, but also steam trains were disallowed in New York City starting in 1908. 
And so if you go back to the Cassat story when he was in the Garde d'Orsay in Paris, he was watching the railroad there use electric trains. So ultimately what the railroad decided to do was build a station in New Jersey called Manhattan Transfer. And what would happen was the trains would come into Manhattan Transfer and they would put an electric locomotive on the trains and pull them using electricity from Northern New Jersey into New York City. Of this, because that said that a tunnel line operated by electricity is the most practical, economical, and the best both for the interests of the railroad and of the city. This is a quote pulled from the New York Tribune newspaper. And once they went beneath the river and pulled into the city, I mentioned a moment ago, Penn Station, a remarkable station. The tunnels and Penn Station opened in November of 1910. When it opened, the New York Times at this moment noted, as the crowd passed through, passed through the doors into the vast concourse, on every hand were heard exclamations of wonder for none had any idea of the architectural beauty of the new structure. It's not exactly the reaction that first time visitors to Penn Station today have, but this was a remarkable structure. And I think I, I jokingly said about first time visitors, I don't know that a lot of people today realize what a grand structure once stood here. It started to train, change a little bit. And of course, Amtrak recently opened the, the new Moynihan train hall which opened at the beginning of the year. And Penn Station is starting to change, but will it ever go back to the glory of 110 years ago? It remains to be seen, I suppose. What I find so interesting about this moment on the Northeast Corridor in and out of New York City is the electrification piece of it. If we look at the corridor today, it's largely electric, it was all the way electric actually between Boston and Washington DC where these cell trains run. But it wasn't at this point in time. It was really only electric in a small portion of it. And several years later, about 18 years later, 1928, 1928, think of this for a moment. This is less than a year before the stock market crash and the start of the Great Depression. A gentleman by the name of William Atterbury, who was then the president of Pennsylvania, announced yet another bolt plan for the railroad in the Northeast Corridor. He announced a plan to eliminate steam trains and electrify the entire Northeast Corridor. Well, what was then the Northeast Corridor between New York City and Wilmington, and ultimately it would become between New York and Washington, D.C., but his initial plan was between New York City and Wilmington, Delaware. And the railroad, if you could imagine it, estimated that the project would cost $100 million, and it would take eight years to complete I don't know if we could electrify the entire line today in eight years, but he said it would take eight years to complete. In fact, by 1931, a portion of it was electrified and trains, locomotives were pulling trains between Wilmington, Delaware and Trenton, New Jersey. Of course, that was just one small section of it. Other sections would follow over the years. And in January, 1933, engineer George Gould sat at the controls of locomotive number 207 it was the first electric train to operate between New York City to Philadelphia. But that wasn't the end. In 1934, after successfully electrifying the line between New York City and Wilmington, Atterbury announced a massive project that would employ at least 25,000 workers. 25,000 workers. They were gonna electrify the rest of the line, bringing to fruition his plan to electrify the entire, effectively then, the Pennsylvania Railroad, I guess I should say, portion of the Northeast Corridor between New York and Washington, D.C. Think about this for a moment. Anybody who's a fan of, of U.S. history recognizes that in 1934, this is in the heart of the Great Depression, the middle of the Great Depression, and they're going to hire 25,000 workers to electrify the line. And what I think is so fascinating about this particular moment, the electrification of it, if you're standing there in 1934, and you're looking at the Pennsylvania Railroad that two decades earlier built a tunnel. They built a tunnel underneath the Hudson River. Now they've electrified the line between New York and Washington, DC. How could this railroad ever 
come to an end. How, how could this railroad ever manage to not go on forever? And yet somehow it was actually nearing the end of its history, if you can believe it, as World War II came and went. As early as 1957, a decade really after World War II, the Pennsylvania began merger talks with its longtime competitor, the New York Central Railroad. It didn't happen immediately, but ultimately it did in 1968. The New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad merged to create the Penn Central Railroad. There were a lot of factors that led to this, the demise ultimately of the Pennsylvania Railroad and, and sort of the demise, tough times, obviously not the demise of railroads, but sort of the, the tough times that railroads encountered in the late 60s and into the 70s. You could look at some of the Federal Highway Acts that were passed in the 1950s, the completion of the interstate system in the mid 1950s. Um, commercial air travel certainly didn't help. And ultimately, the Penn Central that emerged didn't just combine the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad, it also took in the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. And it was a very short lived railroad. It operated from 1968 until 1976, at which point in time Conrail came into existence. A few years before that, Amtrak came into existence to take over the passenger roads. Ultimately, Conrail took over the freight portion of it, and Amtrak took over the, the passenger portion of it. The Penn Central was it's a fascinating railroad. That could be another topic for another day, of course. Even though it was a short-lived railroad, you could probably have a great presentation on the Penn Central. It struggled from day one. It never really merged all the, the disparate railroads together into one cohesive unit. At one point in time, the railroad was actually losing a, a million dollars a day, if you can believe it. And even though the railroad only started in 1968, and 1970 had already declared bankruptcy. And ultimately what happened is Congress stepped in to pass several pieces of legislation. There's the 3R Act and the 4R Act. They are quite boring pieces of legislation, so I won't go too deep into it. But as I mentioned to a moment ago, it led to the creation of Amtrak and Conrail. Conrail, interestingly, although it was really only freight, it did operate commuter rail lines up and commuter railroads up and down the line. And in New Jersey Transit, before New Jersey Transit, for example, it operated uh, the trains in and out of New York City. And ultimately, the creation in, of Conrail and Amtrak really ushered in the modern era that we know, which you could look at starting in the 1980s, once sort of all these different commuter railroads came into being. And I think if we look at the, the modern era, as we move into the creation of Amtrak and, and the operating of, of different freight railroads of Conrail, it was such a, a difficult time for railroads. We think this is a great moment in time where we're creating something new and we've got, uh, you know, there's gonna be a, a better day on the horizon here. And ultimately what happened in the latter half of the 1970s was really a, a difficult era for railroads. And if you look at it in the context of the Northeast corridor, it was a really difficult time for the corridor. And I, I think I alluded to at the beginning of this presentation, Metuchen, New Jersey, that's where I grew up and that's where I first learned of the Northeast Corridor, standing on the platform, watching trains pass. And in 1977, there was a freight derailment in the heart of Metuchen, New Jersey, that I think really illustrates the bad shape that the corridor was in at this point in time. This was a uh, pretty small town, Metuchen, about 17,000 residents, but it, this derailment was quite the spectacle. It was June 22nd, 1977, when 17 or so cars of an 87 car Conrail freight train traveling from Virginia to New York derailed as it was switching tracks near the Lincoln interlocking tower. The ensuing wreck, which sent at least one box car on the main street below, blocked all four tracks of the corridor. Traffic was stopped for a couple of days, but ultimately they got it restored. But it was the aftermath that's most interesting and really most telling about this particular derailment. 
An investigation revealed that the train was traveling somewhere in the neighborhood of 30, 35 miles an hour when it derailed. It's apparently caused by an overheated axle in a freight car. But the real, the real problem was the potential leak of hazardous materials. Two of the cars that derailed carried chlorine gas and a third car had a caustic acid solution. And the derailment itself was one of about 10 that happened in New Jersey between April of 77 and June of 78 that involved railroad cars with hazardous materials. Most of these, well, some of these, I should say, of these mishaps were ultimately brought about by human error. But track defects was another leading cause of derailments in New Jersey. Simply put, the state of railroads in the 1970s and the Northeast Corridor was subpar. This actually, this little derailment here in Metuchen led to hearings in Congress. Congress probed this to see what had happened and what could be done. And a representative out of Pennsylvania named Fred Rooney said, the accident is yet another example of what I consider to be the seriousness of the current deterioration of rail safety. Ultimately, the railroads were able to improve themselves. There's several reasons that went into that. Some of the deregulation, uh, additional congressional actions, such as the Staggers Act, Act, Staggers Act, helped railroads improved. But if we look back on this, 40 years later, we think of the Northeast Corridor largely as a, as a passenger railroad. But today, it is still a freight railroad, with a couple notable exceptions, of course, in and around Penn Station in New York City and South Station in Boston. There's actually four freight railroads that operate over the corridor, CSX, Norfolk Southern, a version of Conrail, it's a little bit different Conrail than it was in the 1970s, and the Providence and Worcester, which carry about 350,000 carloads of freight over the corridor every year. And there's still about 250 businesses that ship or receive freight on the corridor. And this is really the perfect segue to what comes next for the Northeast Corridor and the modern line that we know and love today. This of course is a, a modern train in, uh, on the Northeast Corridor. This is a New Jersey transit train. It's one of the, the new bi-level, run new, it's they're about a decade old at this point, bi-level cars. But for so many people, their touch point with the Northeast Corridor is the commuter element of it. You've got the Long Island Railroad, New Jersey Transit, Mark down in and around the nation's capital in Baltimore area, Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority up in Boston, Metro North, Shoreline East in and around uh, the New York City region, SEPTA in Philadelphia. These are among, these are the railroads that operate commuter services over the Northeast Corridor today. In fact, more than 3,400 commuter trains with more than 1.1 million riders travel across the Northeast Corridor every single day, or I guess I should say at this point in time, did before COVID. We'll see what the numbers are as we fully emerge in the post-COVID world in that part of the country. And I think this is the most, in some ways what we're seeing is the midpoint of the Northeast Corridor. We've talked a lot about the history so far, the building of the tunnel into New York City, the building of Penn Station, and, and a lot of these improvements up and down the line. But I think we'd be remiss at this moment in time if we didn't talk about the one common theme that we've seen throughout every moment on the Northeast Corridor. The one common theme is change. The Northeast Corridor is ever evolving and ever changing. It's evolved since day one. It's never stood still. I putting stood there in air quotes because it's a railroad, it can't stand, but it's, it's never remained the same. It's constantly been upgraded. The lines have constantly been moved slightly. There's been tracks that have been added to it. This was double tracked and then triple tracked and quadruple tracked along portions of it. Stations, in fact, have come and gone over the years. You could look in New Jersey at stations like South Newark and North Railway. They've closed. Others have evolved as we've changed how we move as people. If you think of Metro Park Station, for example, in New Jersey, was built for commuters. It was a commuting station. You've got other stations, such as Secaucus Junction, which have opened and allowed for us to better move from one rail line to another rail line. 
And of course, when you look at the Northeast Corridor today, as Bob Dylan might say, your old road is rapidly aging. The Northeast Corridor, I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, portions of it are upwards of 190 years old. It's an incredibly old section of infrastructure within our country. And we're in a moment in time where we could see perhaps some of the greatest changes that the Northeast Corridor has ever encountered throughout its history. There's plans to replace aging infrastructure. I didn't get into this particular tunnel, but the Baltimore and Potomac Tunnel in Baltimore, it's a $4 billion project to modernize that tunnel and allow for the better movement of trains, allow us to stay more on time on our trains. You've got the $11.6 billion gateway program, which includes replacing the tunnels beneath the Hudson River. The tunnels that were built 111 years ago that are still in place today. And there's a lot of pieces of legislation, if anybody follows Congress, which can be tedious at times, legislation such as the Invest in America Act, which proposes to send billions of dollars to the Northeast Corridor. And as part of this improvements, we're potentially gonna see new trains. Let me go back to this one slide here for a second. This is the a, a illustration of the new Acela train sets, which are currently being tested. The $2.5 billion Acela train sets are expected to enter revenue service, perhaps this year or early as next year. And then the infrastructure itself, I alluded to a moment ago. This slide on the sort of the middle upper picture is uh, the portals in New Jersey of the Bergen, uh, the North, I should say the Hudson River tunnels in, uh, in North Bergen there. On the right hand side is the Potomac, the Baltimore and Potomac tunnel in the Baltimore region, which was built during the Civil War. So even though you know, the line itself we say is 100, you know, portions of it are 170, 180, 190 years old, some of the infrastructure in place goes back to the Civil War and we're still using it today. And then, of course, I alluded to a moment ago, the Moynihan train hall. This is in the old post office building that was uh, right across the street, right next to Penn Station there in, in Manhattan. And so the Northeast Corridor itself is constantly evolving. Now, these are just sort of physical features of the Northeast Corridor. But perhaps the thing we think about when we look at trains as rail fans is the trains themselves are constantly changing and evolving. And I alluded to a moment ago, let me go back to this again, the old or the new Acela train that's coming online here. And it's interesting because we think this is gonna be the next iteration, the next great train that's gonna go up and down the Northeast corridor. And I think if you look at the corridor throughout history, you could find moments in time where we said that the next great train is about to come on the scene. And I put this slide together because it looks at some of the next great iterations of locomotives that were going to operate over the corridor. You could go back to the 1930s and the picture in the upper left here is a GG1 locomotive, uh, probably in the 70s, I want to say, probably in the if I'm not mistaken. The Pennsylvania Railroad placed the first GG1 locomotive into service in 1935. It operated between New York City and Washington. In the upper middle here, you've got a picture of an E60 locomotive, which Amtrak started using in the mid 1970s. A series of problems uh, prompted the railroad to uh, look for another locomotive, even, even though they looked to replace it pretty quickly. It actually stayed in the Northeast Corridor until about the early 2000s. The upper right here is a, a picture of an RC4 locomotive that Amtrak tested. They actually tested French and Swedish locomotives. This, the RC4 was a, a Swedish locomotive. And it was ultimately the basis of really one of the mainstays in the Northeast Corridor, which is a picture in the bottom left in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is the AEM-7. Rail fans affectionately call these locomotives toasters or Swedish meatballs, given their design based on a Swedish RC4 locomotive and two other locomotives that we're gonna to see today. If you were to go walk trains in the Northeast Corridor, you of course have the Acela Express and the Amtrak City Sprinter, the ACS 64 in the bottom right. This is sort of the latest, greatest train uh, that's pulling passenger trains up and down the Northeast Corridor. 
The Acela, of course, went into service in December of 2000. So these locomotives, train sets, I should say, they're really just locomotives, train sets, are two decades old and they're looking to be replaced, whereas the ACS 64 went into service in 2016. And they're just a few years old at this point in time. And what I think is so fascinating about the Northeast Corridor is when you look at the story of the Northeast Corridor and the history of the Northeast Corridor, it is in so many ways the perfect example of railroad history across this country. You can look at railroads really in just about any corner of the country and look at their impact on the communities that they served, how they helped people move from point A to point B, how they facilitated commerce, how at times they were their connection with the outside world. And the same is true for the Northeast Corridor. We maybe don't think about it as much today because when you're in that part of the country, I'm sitting here in Atlanta, Georgia, but if you think of the Northeast section of the country, it's so densely populated. You don't think about the Northeast Corridor passing through small little communities, but that's what it was initially. It was the connection to the outside world. And the Northeast Corridor itself is in so many ways, the story of ingenuity, of grit and determination of the people who envisioned the line and the people who built the line. It's really a story of visionaries and communities. And anybody who has ever taken a train over the Northeast Corridor, even for just a stop or two, has been a part of the corridor's history. It's fascinating because it originated from the idea of finding a better way to travel. Pretty much that's the story of any railroad, right? How do we get from point A to point B quicker? And I look back to something that the directors of the New Jersey Railroad wrote in 1840. Formerly the passage between Philadelphia and New York was performed with great personal discomfort and no small hazard of life and limb. Merchandise was transported from city to city at great expense and subject to all the difficulties and dangers of a coasting voyage. Now, passengers are carried from city to city during the most inclement season with nearly the same comfort as they enjoy at their own firesides. I'd be the first to admit that some days a trip along the Northeast Corridor may not feel as comfortable as our own, our own firesides, but surely it beats the 20 hour wagon ride that uh, people had to endure to travel between Philadelphia and New York City just a few decades before the Northeast Corridor came into existence. And with that, I will say thank you for listening. And I'm happy to certainly take any questions that you might have about the Northeast Corridor. And I'm happy to answer them as best I can or make up answers that sound good. Thank you so much, Todd. That was a uh, wonderful presentation. Um, definitely very informative and very uh, thought provoking and never thought about some of the things you had mentioned um, about the Northeast Corridor. So I'm happy to uh, moderate some questions here. If any of the uh, audience members have any questions, I will uh, pass them over to Todd. Um, so Adam Reich, who actually presented our Northeast Corridor presentation last week, uh, has a question. It says, you mentioned having grown up in Metuchen and a number of the photos you showed us tonight were from Metuchen. Were any of the Metuchen shots from you and our family members? Um, yes, actually. A couple of pictures. Let me see if I can go back to it real quick. The uh, pictures of the 1977 derailment taken in uh, the heart of Metuchen there. Uh, my grandmother actually took that photograph. Awesome. And uh, so I'm trying to think some of, the, some of the other ones I've purchased uh, over the years on uh, old slides. I don't know that in this presentation, we'll, I've taken plenty of pictures of Matush and I can put it that way. Um, I don't know that I, I used as many of my pictures in here. I don't think there's any of mine in here, actually. I'm just trying to scan back through it. But uh, um, let me put my email address back up on here. I'm happy to, to point you to some of my website. I've, I've, got, I've got no shortage of pictures from Matush. Um, okay, next question um, from Stan Smith. Uh, how are the economics for passenger and freight service on the Northeast Corridor? Uh, the Northeast Corridor, I have to look at the numbers again from Amtrak's 
standpoint, I believe that is actually their route that is the most profitable and perhaps their only profitable route. Don't quote me on that. I have to go back and, and double check it. Um, so that is actually from a passenger standpoint, uh, profitable for Amtrak. Um, I'd have to go back and look again. I'd have to look at their latest numbers. That's been a while since I've done that. Um, and then freight ultimately um, provides, so Conrail came into existence in the 1970s and in about 1999, I want to say, ultimately uh, Norfolk Southern and CSX, um, which are two class one railroads, major railroads, I'm sure everybody in the group here is familiar with those railroads, um, basically took over uh, Conrail and, and more or less split it in half. It's not exactly a 50-50 split. Um, so those are two very profitable railroads, um, and from a freight standpoint, it's just it, the Northeast Quarter fits into their their national network. Um, I don't know if I have specific freight num uh, profitability numbers for the Northeast Quarter or portion of it, but uh, um, certainly is a very important piece um, for the, the industries on there. And um, um, but yeah, it's still just a part of there. And I think that actually really goes to show the the turnaround that railroads experienced because we go back to 1977. In the late 70s, really for that matter, we're having derailments and the infrastructure is in a terrible way. And you look at it 20 years later, in the latter half of the 1990s, freight railroads were successful again. And again, there's some legislation that ultimately led to that. Something like the Staggers Act was really vital to that. Um, and it helped signal the transformation of railroads to the point where we could get rid of something largely like Conrail and, and allow the private industry to come in and, and take over those operations. A uh, question from Deborah Davidson, who thanked you very much for your presentation, as calling it very informative, uh, asking where you can uh, be able to purchase your book. Sure, um, you can get it. Uh, it should be in most bookstores um, online, I guess. Um, uh, it should be in most in-person bookstores up there. And of course, if you want to uh, send me an email, I can buy it through my website as well. Um, I'd be happy to. Uh, I didn't put a coupon code on here, but I'm happy to set up a coupon code that I could, could share with everybody that would uh, get a little bit uh, under face value. That would be helpful. Awesome. If you just want to send me a note, it might just be the easiest way as well. Happy to, to do it that way. Okay. A uh, question from Dan Cohen. Is there a good resource for station dimensions for model railroaders? Ooh, that's a good one. I... I was going to just automatically say railfanning.org, my website, but that would just be a total lie, so I, I won't say that. Um, ooh. Um, I'm not, I, I dabble in model railroading, and it's been a while, so I wouldn't say I'm much of a model railroader, and I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that. I would imagine some of the model railroading magazines might have some, and I know there's some good message boards out there. I don't know if they're associated with the, the magazines or not, but they might have some. Were there, were there a station in particular, perhaps? I don't know. Okay. Um, question from uh, a gentleman who just goes by Andy. Uh, what other what VIPs regularly use the Northeast Corridor akin, akin to President Biden's uh, regular commute? Well, of course, um, I do when I'm in that portion of the country. Um, I'm a big VIP that goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, of course, uh, President Biden's um, uh, sort of the, the big example of it. I know other um, politicians at times um, certainly have, um, you know, back when they ran the circus train, for example, if you go on YouTube, there's a great video of uh, the circus train going up and down different portions of the Northeast Corridor. I don't know if it's not really a VIP per se. Um, I know the Amtrak folks um, do at times uh, go up and down the corridor, and I certainly um, seem to have seen private cars up and down the train. I don't know that I would say I have a good list of uh, VIPs that have over the years, but uh, it certainly wouldn't be uncommon to see um, uh, politicians, for example, um, on the train. If, I don't know if they're VIPs or not, but they're uh, well-known people. How about that? Um, <laughs> um, certainly, I know uh, there are probably celebrities who, who have taken it over the years, but I, I don't Know that I would really have a good list. That's actually a good question to research. I'm going to take a note of that because I'm going to look that up. And um, if you want to shoot me an email, I can see if I can find anything to uh, to share back. Uh, I could be wrong, but wasn't it a uh, uh, Robert Kennedy's funeral train come down it, the corridor? Yes, yes, it absolutely did. You're right. That's a, a great, great example as well. Yeah. Um, and there are. I've seen pictures of it. Um, I want to say somebody did a, a story about it on one of the websites I went to, but yeah, the, the Kennedy funeral train did. Yeah. A uh, question from Stan Smith uh, asking who owns the rails? I'm guessing it's more than one authority. Um, and does freight have priority over passenger? 
Um, so who owns the rails? Largely, it's Amtrak. It's not completely Amtrak. There are some different um, authorities that own it in different portions of it. Um, I believe Amtrak owns the entire New York to Washington portion. I think that's correct. And I believe the state of Connecticut owns a portion of it that goes through their state. And I think Massachusetts owns a portion of it that runs through their section uh, or, or their, their uh, region. Um, I would have to double check that. But yeah, it's, it's largely Amtrak, mostly Amtrak, even at that point, but not entirely uh, Amtrak. And uh, that stems from um, ultimately the New York to Washington portion of it was obviously the Pennsylvania Railroad and then Penn Central, and it sort of got handed down from uh, group to group. And there is a, although not really ownership, there is a, a Northeast Corridor Commission as well. So if anybody's interested in some of the uh, ongoing infrastructure projects, if you just go into do an internet search of um, Northeast Corridor Commission, there's a, a whole website that they have out there. And they have a lot more information about some of the, the more granular uh, <laughs> political and, and uh, sort of policy portion of, of that section of it. And um, what was this? I'm sorry, what was the, oh, passenger or over? Yeah, does uh, freight have priority over passenger? I don't believe so. I believe, Am I guess Amtrak, does, but that's, a good, that's an interesting question too. I don't believe they do on, this might be the, a rare case. I know Amtrak has a big issue, certainly when it runs trains, not on the Northeast Corridor that run over uh, the host railroads where freight trains um, tend to try to take, or freight roads tend to give their own trains uh, priority um, over Amtrak trains, although I know there's been some discussion about that, certainly at the federal level. But um, I want to say, I'm going to look a little bit deeper into that one, but I want to say that Amtrak um, passenger trains would have precedence on the corridor. And there's a lot of schedules too. There's very, uh, it's fascinating uh, the way the schedules do work. Because you, you think about it, it's not just freight trains, although freight trains, um, tend to run at night, I want to say, through like the New Jersey portion of it. Um, it's, it's also the commuter railroads, too, that uh, you have to keep in mind um, as well, like New Jersey Transit. I talked a lot about that, but the MBTA up in uh, Massachusetts and, and Mark and SEPT and everything as well. Okay. So a lot of coordination required. Um, we have a question here from Reg Mitchell. It's more so a uh, Pennsylvania Railroad question than a Northeast Corridor question. Uh, but it says Trains Magazine had an article several years ago with the thesis that Cassatt should have spent the PRR's money on a low grade freight line across Pennsylvania instead of all the passenger improvements. If so, the PRR would probably still around the thesis proposed. So, any comments on that? That's an interesting one. I, I haven't read that particular article. Um, that is a, a fascinating examination of it. Because um, I go back to sort of that moment in time and, in, in, you know, right around World War II, 1940s, late 30s, into the 40s. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of made note of that idea of, you know, how could this railroad ever go away when you think about some of the massive improvements that it made? Um, it's hard to know. I, I think alternate, that's not really alternate history, but sort of the idea of thinking about what could have been, I think, are, are really fascinating to ponder. Um, I don't know. There were a lot of headwinds in the 50s. And I don't know if the article in particular talked about that. Um, just sort of the, the idea of, you know, we, we being we as people changed how we moved, um, how we traveled. Uh, we like the freedom of cars for better or worse. Um, we did like the freedom of cars and the, the freedom to be able to fly from point A to point B. Um, so there were a lot of headwinds. I mean, a lot of railroads had difficulties in the 1960s. So I don't, I, I don't know if the author of that particular article talked a lot about that, but that would be interesting um, as well to think about. And I, I'm sure that would play into it as well. Um, it sounds like I'm going to actually look that up and see if I can find a back issue of that, because that'd be a fascinating read on it. I don't know is the short answer if it would have played out differently, um, but it is fun to think about, if nothing else. Uh, we have an anon anonymous uh, question asker uh, says, is it true that there was an Amtrak money train uh, that used to run to balance the cash on hand of the mints on the Northeast corridor for many years? Okay. Well, Woody Harrelson movie was, no, that was, that was a New York city subway. <laughs> it's a bad joke. Um, I, I do not know that to be honest. I do not Amtrak money train. It's possible, I guess is the short answer, but I, I, I don't know for sure. Okay, um, that looks to be the last of the questions. Uh, again, Todd, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful presentation on the corridor. Uh, we definitely appreciate having you. Uh, thank to, you for having uh, me. It was, it was a lot of fun.
Yeah, the uh, from the comments scrolling through here, it looks like uh, it was very well received. So we uh, we greatly appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the, uh, a lot of success with your book. And uh, we hope you see you around again sometime. Uh, appreciate so, it. So for all those in attendance, um, our next meeting, our next presentation will be August 12th, which is actually another uh, Pennsylvania Railroad centric presentation, which will be dealing with the wreck of the broker, which is a Pennsylvania commuter train in Woodbridge, New Jersey, which was the deadliest uh, and still remains the deadliest uh, train derailment or accident in the state of New Jersey. Um, so we'll be uh, bringing back Gordon Bond for author Gordon Bond for that presentation. We hope to see you there. Uh, Todd's presentation tonight will be made available on YouTube. And Todd, I will share that with you so you can uh, have that for your uh, archive. Fantastic. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone again next time. So uh, Todd, again, thank you and uh, good night, everybody.